right, welcome to the first session this afternoon. Our first speaker is Ulf Danielsson, who will tell us about the quantum swampland. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. It's my second time in Madrid at this institute, and I'm very sorry that I missed yesterday. And before I switch picture here, notice the, the quantum ingredient here in the light up here. I'm very proud of the picture. Okay, so the outline is basically this one. So first I will give some kind of, just to, to put everything in context, some comments on the sort of the classical part of what might be a swamp plant, as well as the non-perturbative part. And then just not to get too depressed, we'll take an excursion away from this swamp region to see whether there are some, well, some kind of escape route somewhere. And then we'll go back and see that things are probably even worse when we start to consider quantum effects. And everything is sort of in one way or the other circulating around the, the swampland conjecture, whether that is something that can actually be proven to, to be true or maybe something similar to it. Now just to, to put some th things into, into context and see where we are, we have a map here of, of the world. So up here, in the, let's see, up, up there, we have the classical de Sitter in the Mirkwood. And down here, we have the non-perturbative de Sitter down in Mordor. And around the unexplored regions of Rune, we have what will come to the quantum swampland. And then the possibility of going west towards the brain worlds. And that is something that we will be considering in a moment. So first, thinking about the classical swamp. Okay, so that is something that people have been worrying about for a number of years, trying to see whether you can construct the sitter solutions using really simple ingredients like fluxes and at most orientifold, nothing more exotic than that. And well, when you start to work, around, work with these different ingredients, you, you think that this shouldn't be too difficult actually. I mean, certainly there are lots of different parameters, just if you tune them in the right way, you should be able to find something, at least a few examples. And then it turns out that there are actually lots of conspiracies around. And what you can, with a lot of trouble, and they are rather, rather scarce, you can find tachyonic de Sitterwerke, and they have been known for some years. And, well, you can also think about whether you could find some kind of a quintessence solutions, at least, maybe close to such a tachyonic solution somewhere else. And this was explored five years ago, and we didn't manage to find more than maybe a couple of e-foldings, not more than that. And this is even before you start to consider such issue, issues as quantizations of fluxes. If you consider that, well, then it might very well be that even these tachyonic the sitters out, out through the window. And in fact, there is no counterexample to the mathematically formulated swampland conjecture. And then, of course, there, are, there is another possible way out. That would be to consider non-geometric fluxes. With non-geometric fluxes, you, are more, you have more parameters to play with. You can find stable de Sitter vacuum, but you don't know what these geometric fluxes really mean. Well, actually, the non-geometric fluxes, there is a possibility that some of them are a restricted type where you can at least locally have a geometric interpretation. And when you put things together, globally, you find that what you actually are doing is you, you, that you are studying some kind of more non-trivial topology, which is disguised as non-geometric fluxes. But so far, none of the de Sitter stable de Sitter vacua obtained by non-geometric fluxes, as far as I know, can be obtained in such a scenario where you can really interpret what the non-geometric fluxes really are. So that doesn't seem to be too, too hopeful. Then if you go to the non-perturbative swamp, well, there has been a lot of discussions uh, concerning the uh, uh, antebrains and whether they are they could, oops, sorry, whether they could possibly be uh, unstable. And uh, to me, this is more like a second order problem at the moment. You, there is certainly a lot more to discuss, discuss about those, but there are other concerns which 
might be more important, such that the possibility that there is a back reaction on the moduli, so the stability of the whole construction is lost from that point of view, or even more, kind of a zeroth order problem, where there are concerns that you're not really taking the, you're re not really viewing the non-perturbative corrections in the correct way, and maybe even the supersymmetric starting point could be in doubt. So neither within this classical uh, models or within the non-perturbative models, there are any single example of a de Sitter solution which you could really agree that this is something which have, have, have some hope of working. Well, there are different opinions, obviously, about that, as you, as you all know, and I'm sure you discussed yesterday. Now, before coming to, to, to the real um, subject of my talk, the, the quantum swamp plan, just some comments on a possible escape route. Quintessence has been discussed as a way to get around the swamp plan conjecture. That is, you are not aiming to find really a time-independent vacuum that is a de Sitter solution, but you would allow that there's some kind of a time evolution. And in that way, you might get around it. Well, you could imagine that the time evolution is not in, 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 in the, the visible dimensions, but something which is happening in in the other extra dimensions. And in fact, what you could imagine is that you, rather than seeing the instabilities that we are now discovering as a problem, see them as a virtue and see whether you can actually make use of them in order to construct something which is like an effective de Sitter solution. And this is behind, sorry, this proposal where, where what you have here is, is really a, um, you have an unstable ADS vacuum, non-supersymmetric ADS vacuum, which is, which is um, decaying through a nucleation of a bubble on the true vacuum like this. And this bubble is now expanding rapidly. And the idea is that there is a brain world on top of this bubble, and that is where we are living. OK, how would it be to live on such a bubble? Well, the first thing that you can do is to consider the junction condition, the Israel junction conditions. And k plus and k minus, or lambda plus and minus, are the cosmological constant, the negative cosmological constant on the outside and the inside. It should be a square there, by the way. Sorry about that. And if you then do that, and you can even generalize the metric here in such a way that you include some five-dimensional matter, matter which there is a metric function here, m of r, which might be a constant if you have to have a Schwarzschild metric, or it might depend on r if you have a distributed mass, mass, mass distribution. So if you do this and expand these expressions to square root for big values of the cosmological constant, then you can actually get something which looks exactly like the Friedman equations. And, and here you can identify the cosmological constant up here. The cosmological constant there is actually given by the ratio between the difference between the, the critical value where there is a bubble at all that can nucleate and the actual tension of the brain. So if nucleation can proceed by construction, the cosmological constant will be positive. And you can also calculate then the effective value of the four-dimensional Newton's constant. And you see already here that the kind of matter that you get is naturally radiation. I should, before proceeding and just ending with a couple of comments on this this model is that there are crucial differences between this model and the randall sandrum scenario. The randall sandrum scenario has two bubbles, well, which are two insides which are joined across the brain. That is the typical setup in randall sandrum And there you naturally can construct models which are ADS, but there is some difficulty in constructing the sitter vacuum. You typically need some kind of an uplift, actually. So it's a little bit like what you do in KQLT. If you have an inside and an outside, which we have here, and there is really a time-dependent transition, things are different. And in fact, the natural value of the cosmological constant, even if you have a BPS brain, the lowest tension brain, which is the easiest one to nucleate, even if you have that, then you naturally get the positive value of the cosmological constant. OK, there's several questions that you need to ask. One of them is, how do you get matter? And while this is something that would satisfy an astronomer, a cosmologist, that you can do cosmology in this way, but what about localized gravity? Is that something that you can achieve in this setup? 
Well, there has been some attempts, similar attempts in the past, which have been discarded because there, is some, there are some crucial thing, ingredients that we believe were lacking, which we have added. And you will see, see that, that in, in, in this picture here. One of them is that in order for, to be able to, to get dust, to get matter, you would need to have mass, really the total mass within the sphere to increase linearly with the radius. That is something that you can achieve if you have, uh, if you have strings which are stretching outwards from this expanding bubble. And the bubble sort of eats these strings. And in this way, you sort of mimic what dust would do in the, in the four-dimensional effective theory there. Another very non-trivial calculation that we did was to consider the gravitational attraction between localized such stretched strings. And when you perform such a calculation, you can see that they attract with just, you do this in the Newtonian limit, and then you can see that the force between them is indeed like Newtonian gravity with exactly the right value of the four-dimensional Newton's constant as predicted by the Friedman equation. So we see that this is a very non-trivial check that this idea actually works. Now, that means that in the transfer space to these stretch strings, you have something which is like four-dimensional effective gravity. You might worry about that this is now stretched infinitely far out from our universe out into infinite five-dimensional space, but here you need to, to keep in mind that what you need in order to have an astronomically large universe is obviously that the volume of the boundary here needs to be astronomically big. So is the radius, or rather the coordinate, coordinate radius, which corresponds to the, to the scale factor. But the actual proper distance as calculated here will be rather small due to the curvature, the fact that you are in ADS space. So that means that you can fit the whole universe in the throat, which is part of a com compactified geometry, and the universe can expand for billions and billions and billions of years, while these strings need to not have anything more than a microscopic length. And that means that this is more like an ordinary kind of compactification. So we are just proposing that, and I think that the main idea here is really to look for time-dependent solutions in the extra dimensions, maybe through phase transitions like this, revive the work of the brain worlds and see if you, in this way, can find a way to circumvent the swamp plan conjecture. And this is sort of a proposal of how you can, you can take care of some of the issues that, uh, that, uh, th that might come up. And maybe this will all bring us back to the swamp plan again, who knows? Okay, so what I now would like to continue with is really the, the main topic of my talk, and that is what about quantum loop correction, really quantum mechanical corrections, what will happen? And here there is this extremely important issue of vacuum choice, something which has sort of been ignored in our community, but is something which is a big concern for many field theorists, which have been working on these problems for many, many years, and coming to a conclusion that there is something really funny going on in the city space. And I will try to, to see whether we can make some contact with that literature and the kind of things that we are doing. And I have some concrete proposals on, on how to do that. So first, let us do something really simple. We, let us do a very naive calculation of the vacuum energy. After all, we are looking for a cosmological constant that might have a considerable contribution which is coming from the vacuum energy. After all, that, this is more or less how the famous 10 to the 120 error problem arose. So you take as a scalar field, we have some cut of energy, and we do the integrals, and we get quartic, quadratic, and terms which are independent of the cutoff. Okay, then you might say that, okay, that means that the contribution to the cosmic constant goes like it's quartic in the cutoff, cutoff quartic in the in the, in, the, in, the plank, in, the, in the in the plank mass. Well, if you then make a corresponding calculation of the pressure, you might get a little bit confused because the first two terms, they don't fit with what you would expect from a cosmological constant, only the third term does. So then people are arguing that maybe these first two are just an artifact of the 
fact that you have a cutoff, which is not invariant. You have it in energy, but clearly that is, means that you have selected some particular frame of reference. So no wonder that you get things which are a little bit strange. So maybe the only thing that you can really trust is actually this contribution where, where there is no cutoff, uh, well, there is no polynomial uh, power of the cutoff sitting there anyway. Okay, you can also get some encouragement in that mode of thinking by doing a dimensional regularization where you find that you only, of course, get these terms. Now, there is a way to go a little bit beyond this, and that is to, to make the following observation. That is that if you take a derivative respect to the m squared, you can actually rewrite this in a manifestly invariant way. And here, once here, you can make an analytical continuation to Euclidean space, and you can introduce an invariant cutoff. So now lambda is not in energy, it's, it's really more like a mass. And you can do the integral, and you do this. And then, of course, you introduce a constant of integration, this mu here. And you can, of course, end up with exactly the same kind of expression by, by going through effective field theory, where that mu is a parameter that you need to introduce in order to define the path integral. And what you end up with is, if, is of course, the Coleman-Weinberg potential, which you can dress up and then you sum over all possible particles, maybe in a supersymmetric theory, where maybe the, the first terms are, are canceling uh, automatically and there are some where even the second term is, is, uh, is, is not there. But you see here, there is a... There's some little cheating here, and then we'll go from one to the other, and we might be, be concluding that, okay, th this is really the answer. Now we have done everything correctly. It's an invariant cutoff, and we can also make contact, actually, with string theory calculations, which have been, been uh, you can see that they sort of match this, this general, general structure. So that, that, that's great. But what about the choice of vacuum? Here, if we assume that we are just in Minkowski space, there is not much to talk about. And this continuation that we did to Euclidean space and whatever, there's no big deal there. But if we are in this sitter, it's an altogether different matter. And in fact, in the sitter space, there is no unique vacuum, but there is one preferred vacuum, preferred by some, which is the Bunch-Davis vacuum. The Bunch-Davis vacuum is obtained by, Euclidean, by a continuation from, it, from the Euclidean sphere. That's one way of defining the, the Bunch-Davis vacuum. And the Bunch-Davis vacuum is, is implicit in, in all calculations, like in inflation, etc., and also based, as we'll come back to, to the notion that at really small distances, you shouldn't care about whether you're in the sitter or anything else. And that's also one way that naturally leads to the Bunch-Davis vacuum. But... Many people, in particular Polyakov and Mottola, has argued that Bunch Davis vacuum is simply unphysical. There is something which is fundamentally wrong with the Bunch Davis vacuum at, and in, in, in the city space. And I will not have the time to go through all of these various arguments. Just let me highlight a couple of the ways that you can see that there is something fishy going on. And there is a beautiful comparison with a constant electric field. And the issue whether a constant electric field will be decaying or not. Well, we know the Schwinger effect, which suggests that electrons and positrons, let's say, are pair produced and will discharge the electric field. We think that, that that's the natural expectation. That is what will happen. Really, there is really already there a kind of a puzzle, because you start out with something which is completely time translationally invariant. But then we are, we are comfortable by saying that, no, this, this time translation invariance will be broken, there will be this decay. Now, what Mottola and, and, uh, and Polakov are saying is that that is not actually true, uh, but you, make, you can make a comparison with the sitter space, and then the Bunch-Davis vacuum is in the similar way the unnatural vacuum that would lead to no Schwinger effect. Similarly, you can argue for uh, ultraviolet uh, dependence, sensitivity. 
Just if you imagine that the electron and the positron can, if, if the electric field is turned on for a very long time, they can move for a long time and accelerate to high energies, so high energies that you approach the kind of a cutoff that you have in the theory. So even here, there's a UV sensitivity. And the other way is to argue for why the Bunch Davis vacuum might not be the right one. Okay, now, another way to, way to argue for it is to move way back in time to a time when the a given mode had a very, very short wavelength. Then you could say that if I don't notice that I'm in the city space, there is a unique vacuum. The point is that you cannot go arbitrarily far back in time if there is a fundamental cutoff. But you might go back to that time and there introduce a particular vacuum choice. The simplest choice that you could make is simply that, that the, what's called the instantaneous Minkowski vacuum, so that you impose not at the infinite past as we do here, but at the finite time when a given mode is of the order of that fundamental scale. That's where you impose your condition. And then you find a different vacuum. A vacuum which is fed in from the cutoff by new modes all along as time moves on. This means that you, in your vacuum, has an additional contribution on top of the Bunch-Davis vacuum to the background energy. You have to integrate up to the cutoff and you find an extra contribution. Clearly, this contribution is incredibly small. It's really a very, very good approximation to say that you are in Minkowski space. Absolutely. It's incredibly small. It's of the order of 10 to the minus 120 times Planck scale or something like that in our present universe because it will be of the order of the Hubble scale squared times the fundamental scale squared. So even though it's tiny, it can have a cosmological importance. So what happens now is that you have to also feed these modes in at that high scale. That means that you have to insert a source term in the continuity equation. If you then choose this pair of Friedman equations, the continuity equation, together with a particular one of the Friedman equations, which happens to be the one, this is very convenient and elegant to do it in this way, because this is the guy that certainly will not be modified by the source, because it has this thermodynamical interpretation. So it's only in one place where there will be a source term added, and if you do that, if you do that, then you find that the Hubble constant will be decaying. The Cosmel constant is still tied to a constant of integration, but now it's not a constant of integration, but due to this source of energy coming from the fact that you are not in the Bunch-Davis vacuum, energy is drained by consistency from the cosmic constant that will be decaying in this way. Okay, so it's drained like that. Now, having that as a starting point, you could also, just for fun, try to evaluate what this would mean for the constant C in the Swampland conjecture. So I'm, I'm telling you that there is, I'm trying to argue that there is a way, a natural way, to just slightly change the quantum vacuum. The Bunch Davis vacuum is not a natural one, just a slight change, and I get a value like this, and this is my next to last slide. And this value then will be critically depending on this scale, which we don't know what it is, but it's some high energy scale, and then the number of fields, and this can easily, obviously, be a value of order one. So that is the kind of toy model that I'm, that I'm suggesting. And, okay, this kind of UV sensitivity and this quantum, quantum effect is clearly something that you cannot, think, well, the instability of the city space argued by field theorists is something that we have to be concerned with from the point of view of string theory. And I'm arguing that it's natural that it will have this, this kind of size. And furthermore, if this now is a rather gen generic argument on the quantum side, maybe through string dualities, you could take the conceptual insights on the quantum side and dualize it into other corners of the landscape and get a better understanding of why uh, this might be a general effect. So, thank you.
Questions and comments? Uh, so, sorry, in, in your last uh, comment about this uh, draining and the connection to the Decidua Swampland conjecture, are you, uh, do you have an argument that this solves the coincidence problem somehow? I don't, I, I'm, because, I'm because a small number, I mean, why is it important today and not, say, uh, at redshift 10 or 100, you know? I, I don't think I have any, any ambition to, to, to solve that. So the only thing that I'm, that I'm arguing for is a general, uh, a general mechanism which will, given a cosmic constant, will drain it at a certain, at the speed which I cannot calculate, but I argue that it can be big, and this is an effect which is in line with the swampland conjecture. I have no, I have not tried to make any, any kind of phenomenology or anything like that out of this. You could certainly try to do that, but that, that's, that's not my goal at the moment. Sorry, so the, the idea is that you have some cosmological constant, classically, say, the sitter, and then once, once that becomes larger than dark matter, only then this mechanism sets in and starts draining it. It will certainly, it will certainly be affected by other matter. Absolutely. You would, have to, you would have to solve all of these equations together. But I would, I would think that, that, the, that the effect is there already from, from the beginning. Just the fact that the universe is expanding... Just the fact that the universe is expanding and modes need to be fed in at the cutoff will, would imply a drainage effect, even if everything is, is swamped by other matter in the universe and the, and the expansion of the universe is dominated by other effects. So it would, I mean, it would, it would happen even in the early universe where the cosmic constant is completely, uh, you cannot see its effect because of other matter contributions in the universe. So it would be present there as well, I would guess. Could, could you go back just to the, I think it was the second to last slide, the, the one that had the, um, uh, yeah, that, that one. So, so if lambda were, were the cutoff you would expect from um, sort of from species arguments, it would be m Planck over square root of the number of fields. Yeah, and then you have an n. And then, yeah, you have a root n in the numerator of this. Yeah. Does that? And, yeah, yeah. So it would be a big number. There could be other numbers here as well. I mean, this is just an order of magnitude estimate, so don't know. But this would say that... In gravity plus a bunch of particles, if there's a large number of particles, the vacuum energy decays very rapidly. Yeah. Um, regarding the first part of the of your talk, uh, I, I imagine you can also use the same method for inflation for the early universe. Absolutely. Um, so in that regard, can can you stop the bubble from from expanding? I mean, how do you have reheating that type of model? Actually, I mean, there, there are possibilities that you might want to explore. If we go back here, if you look at the, if you look at the Friedman equation here, and that is that they could certainly, and this is something that we haven't really explored at all, we've been thinking about what could happen here. Because in principle, if you, there is a, if you think of sigma here as the BPS, if you have a BPS brain here, then you have, sort of, then you have the maximum value of the cosmological constant. If there's something happening on top of the brain, and this, this goes, sort of goes in the other direction against what you might expect, but if there are thing, extra things on top of the brain, that would reduce the cosmological constant. So, I mean, you could certainly imagine that there's some kind of non-trivial evolution here in the tension of the brain so that you have a large tension uh, have sorry yeah you have a large cosmic constant in the beginning and then as time goes on there is some transitions in the bubble so that it's that speed of its it, it, its expansion changes i mean it, that's that's possible of course and then again if the second half of my talk is, is has anything to do with reality and and the first half as well then of course these quantum effects should somehow effectively work in this four-dimensional setting as well. So. No, no questions? No. If not, we thank you again.